So uh, Bjorn asked me to uh, have a talk, and he gave me the subject, right? So this is not my title. Evolution and morphogenesis under variable boundary conditions. So I tried to figure out what he meant by that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so basically that's uh, anything you can think of. Uh, type this like biology, right? So, but what annoys me slightly, and that's what I'm going to talk about, is this concept that life is reacting to some boundary conditions outside it. And by that, presumably, um, is meant the uh, geology and the astronomy and other things coming from the outside, acting on the biosphere. And that this biosphere is some kind of victim to this uh, external processes. And that's not how it is at all. I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> um, so, this is kind of the iconic uh, physical model, right? Or mathematical model. model. You have some boundary conditions, and in this case, have mixed boundary conditions, and then you have something inside that is reacting, right? You have a temperature, for example, uh, assigned to the boundary, and then you plot what's happening inside. And that's the uh, simple situation. That's what we call boundary conditions. But most systems are not like that, right? Most systems are like this, that you have some kind of uh, field, and then you could, like air, you, you want to model the aerodynamics of a windmill. So you model the air flowing through the system, and that will cause this feather to move, right? That's the problem. So you can't treat the shape of this structure as boundary conditions because it's reacting to the flow, uh, and acting back on the flow. So the flow will change as this structure is moving. So you have moving boundary conditions that are uh, influenced by the thing you want to model and is working back on it again. So it's a feedback process. So the causation goes kind of from your continuum model of the, of the flow um, field to the boundary conditions, but then the boundary conditions are changing in response, and then um, this goes iteratively. So if we look at the Earth, um, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of obvious what is special about Earth. Uh, this is Venus, this is an Im processed image of this uh, iconic Lemura images, but it's, uh, it's a real image. Uh, this is Mars, obviously, and this must be Earth. Uh, and the big difference is, of course, that we have life. Um, life changes Earth so radically that it must be seen as the one of the major forces working on the Earth system. Um, and I'll talk about how this works. So just give a few examples of how life on Earth is really controlling the geology. I'm not saying that geology is not controlling life, this goes both ways. If you go outside, I can easily tell from the vegetation what the geology is, right? The geology is controlling life, I don't disagree with that, but it's just as much the other way around. So I'll just give a few examples. Uh, so first of all, uh, for example, the great oxygenation event two and a half billion years ago, um, when um, the atmosphere of the Earth really started to increase its oxygen content. And this caused major geological perturbations. Uh, for example, the oxidation of iron in the oceans, causing these plant and iron formations. Uh, this was triggered by the evolution of photosynthetic organisms. Um, and um, when this reduced the CO2 in the atmosphere to such an extent that we have got the snowball earth situation, the greenhouse effect disappeared, and you got a very, very cold, very, very cold earth. Uh, this is called the Huronian glaciation, and the first snowball one was the first really big snowball earth uh, event, and it was triggered by life, an evolution of life. By the way, uh, you may have seen, um, the, I think it was in 2008, 
there was a paper uh, that was in quite a commotion where it was claimed that more than two thirds of the mineral on Earth would not have been here without life. Uh, and that has to do with the oxidation state, that the, there is so much oxygen in the atmosphere on the Earth that we get all kinds of oxide minerals. Uh, so that the mineralogy on Earth is controlled by life. I'm not sure if that's true because we find oxides here, obviously, on other planets as well. We find hematite and sulfates so, uh, so and things on Mars, for example. But still, uh, this changed the chemistry of the Earth radically. Um, so just a curve of the uh, showing the oxygen on Earth. This is based on sulfur and carbon isotopes. Uh, so this big uh, snowball one uh, oxygen nation event happened about a uh, little more than two billion years ago, and then the oxygen content in the atmosphere was increasing steadily. Uh, and at this point, in the cryogenia. Uh, in the late Proterozoic, we, for some reason, we get another uh, leap in the oxygen content of the atmosphere. And this must be caused by biological processes again. Some evolutionary events, such as the evolution of multicellularity. So you got more efficient photosynthesis in multicellular algae, for example. And this caused another ice age, or another snowball Earth. Again, triggered by life. Um, and Norway is famous for this. We have the type of penalty for the Valangina, the big uh, glaciation event in uh, the latest Proterozoic. So it's quite spectacular. We have uh, glacial striations and basal fields, and uh, all you need to show that this is a major glaciation. And possibly, again, ice covered the whole of the Earth. So it was a total glaciation again. And it's quite kind of funny to look at, for example, the carbon isotope curve. Uh, this is 800 million years ago. This is present. So you see during this time when we had these enormous glaciations, that the carbon isotope curve makes these very, very big excursions. And then at the base Phanerozoic uh, in the Cambria, things got to slightly more stable. And you get more autocorrelation in the curve. So there's very big perturbations that were typical for the late Proterozoic. And it's exactly at this time that you get the Cambrian explosion of life, uh, that evolution really accelerates. Uh, and I kind of call this, you had the great oxygenation, I call this the great optimization event in the history of Earth. This is when evolution really uh, accelerated, and you can. I, I kind of like to see this as if you have no optimization, you know, this uh, simulated annealing uh, algorithm where you uh, speed up the optimization by starting with very large perturbations to the system. So you jump around in your, opti in your uh, optimization landscape to try to find the local optima. And then when you, uh, then when you are after you have done these big jumps, you slowly decrease the uh, uh, mutations of the jumps in the system so that you uh, optimize on the local optimum. And this is kind of what's happening here. You have a big perturbations to the system. Uh, so evolution would kind of make life would make big jumps to adapt to the situation. And then it kind of this perturbation slow down, and you optimize the biosphere on a, uh, a more local scale. Uh, next big glaciation. I'll skip the Andromedation one, but uh, for the Carboniferous, uh, it's called the Karoo glaciation. Um, we get another peak in oxygen. This is around the Carboniferous um, time. So we get an enormous increase in the oxygen in the atmosphere. And that causes I get another glaciation. So all these glaciations are caused by evolutionary events. The event this time is the colonization of the land by terrestrial plants. So you get a much faster uh, 
rate of photosynthesis on Earth because of this. This happens in the carboniferous. And just uh, to show uh, the influence on, on animals as well, like you get this in the carboniferous, you get these enormous uh, invertebrates, huge uh, insects and uh, invertebrate animals. This is the Arthropleura, which is a kind of a centipede. Maybe three meters long. Well, I don't know if you saw this BBC series a few years ago where there was this slightly annoying uh, Englishman with the same story. I like that because you get a sense of scale. People are perfect for giving scales to things and really see how big things work. Uh, and this is explained by uh, the very, very high content of oxygen in the atmosphere because these are not very efficient at pumping air around the body, so they are dependent on high oxygen uh, concentrations to uh, allow the body to grow that big. So that was a lot of yassiations, all presumably caused partly at least by evolution of life. Um, just another example uh, of uh, how life can control geological processes. Uh, this is uh, a paper where they studied fluvial sediments, that is sediments formed around rivers. And if you look at the uh, uh, look at the, uh, the fossil record of meandering rivers and these lateral accretion sets, which are when sediment overflows the rim banks, you get this uh, accretion sets left over. You don't see those until the late Silurian, early Devonian. Before that, all the rivers were more or less braided rivers. Um, but after the early Devonian, we start to see that uh, meandering rivers with lateral accretion sets, they really come into uh, the geological record. And this is obviously caused by the stabilization of riverbanks by land routes, because this is exactly the time when uh, big land, land plants colonized the earth. Uh, yeah. Another big geological event was the uh, what's called the calcareous phytoplankton revolution in the Cretaceous. So as you know, this white cliffs of Dover and many carbonates around the world in the Cretaceous, they were, are formed, they are built by, by, by life. And this is caused mainly by the evolution of the coccolithophorids, which are calcareous narrow plankton. Just to show the amazing scale of these algal blooms, this is a typical Satellite picture of uh, all these algal blooms in the in sky. Mm -hmm. So it's incredible volumes of, uh, of uh, calcium carbonate, which is produced in the ocean by these organisms. So you're starting to see that the geology on Earth is controlled completely by life. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, now this is as is really clear. I mean, it's more obvious than ever because now geological processes on Earth are more or less controlled by us, right? And we are life as well. So it's just another example. Uh, so uh, when I was teaching geology to first-year students, I taught them about sedimentological and other processes all through the year, and then in the last lecture I told them, forget all you learned about all these processes, they are not dominant anymore. The dominant geological process on Earth now is the uh, erosion and other things that are uh, controlled by humans. If you look around you, it's obviously the dominant geological process on Earth, human activity. Uh, just a few examples of this, I mean, how the Earth looks at night. It's obvious that we are, changed, we are changing the planet completely. So yet another round of uh, biological control of geological processes. 
you may know this number as well, but just to repeat them, uh, the biomass of humans is 40 megatons on Earth. The complete biomass of all other land records is 5 megatons. So, terrestrial life now basically means humans. And if you include the domesticated animals, these are wild animals, yeah? that's 100 megatons. So for each kilo of us, there is two and a half kilo of uh, domesticated animal. Uh, together, 140 megatons of uh, terrestrial vertebrate life is basically on it. It's either humans or in, controlled by humans. Net primary productivity, that's basically photosynthesis. 40% of that now goes directly to humans. Uh, Depending on how you count, 15 to 55 percent of the total land area of Earth is appropriated for our use. That depends how you count. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that that primary productivity in the oceans as well? That's a good question. I don't know. I think five point two nine eight, but I'm not sure. And so, how that could well be. No, These are not my time. numbers, so that this could be a terrestrial primary productivity. Yeah. Land and, and marine are comparable, so it just sort of cut the number in half. So. It's still quite a big number. And again, this depends a lot on how you count, but uh, uh, oft quoted number is that 20% of all the pre anthropocene species will be extinct by not just so we are in a mass extinction. Is that vertebrates? No, that's all uh, invertebrate and plant species, but not the microbes. This is uh, extinction of multicellular organisms. We basically don't know about microbes and unicellular organisms. <coughs> And then uh, I want to be just a little bit more clown, so I'm going to make a few slides now which are more or less jokes, or maybe not to think about it. Uh, you often see this question of could there be life on Earth without plate tectonics? It's often claimed that plate tectonics is one of the things that have allowed life to evolve on Earth. Without that, we couldn't have life because plate tectonics is recycling nutrients, etc. But I want to turn this question around, could there be plate tectonics on Earth without life? And how can that be? How can life be running plate tectonics? Well, the surface temperature of Earth is now on average about 13 degrees Celsius. Uh, it has been computed that without life, the surface temperature will be uh, in the region of 300 degrees Celsius, and that's because of the greenhouse effect. Right? Life is Reducing the temperature on the surface of the Earth by almost 300 degrees Celsius. Colossal amount. Uh, the temperature in the outer mantle is, I don't know what you would say, but in the region of 1000 to 3000 degrees Celsius. Can, can you explain that uh, 290 degrees C? It just doesn't look right. Um, well, that's not my number, that's kind of a standard textbook number of. Uh, People have been doing modeling of Earth with the kind of the same carbon dioxide concentration as you have on Venus, for example. Do you know the surface so many parts of that carbon dioxide? Hmm? The number comes from assuming you can't subduct okay. carbon dioxide. Okay. But you had to subduct carbon dioxide early to make the Earth climate. Uh, so there could be life in the first place. Well, and you also had a weaker sun. Yeah, you had a weaker sun and stuff, yes. Agreed. I, again, this is kind of a joke. I, I'm not going to guarantee that this is a correct number. As far as I remember in this model, they also said this is plus or minus 50 degrees Celsius. Or of course, this depends on many, many things that would have been completely different in, in other circumstances. So uh, it's not true, but that's. Just accept uh, uh, text with logic. <laughs> this means that the temperature gradient from the surface and down to the upper mantle would be different by some 10% or something. We don't have enough 
that would obviously have consequences for plate tectonics. I, I'm not saying that things would stop, that the plates would stop without life, but things would be different. And especially if you take into account that at these temperatures there would be no liquid water at the surface of the Earth, and that also influences plate tectonics enormously because the subduction of water uh, is a very important factor in the uh, plate tectonics. And also the uh, uh, heat transport from the mantle to the surface is also, of course, uh, increased by things like hydrothermal convective cooling under the seafloor, which is also dependent on liquid water. So, uh, if plate tectonics would not stop, at least it would probably be quite different, maybe slower without life. That's obviously why you don't have plate tectonics on Venus. <laughs> uh, so when you look at Henrik's theory for mass extinction, so magmatism causes carbonized of extractions, warming events, and this causes mass extinctions. What if it were the other way? We get the mass extinction, that stops plate tectonics, and in some funny way that influences magmatism. <laughs> That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, uh, my point is just that life is influenced in geology. And that therefore you have pulsations in both directions. Uh, so, in what way can we then come back to this thing about boundary conditions? Obviously, we have to just extend the scope of this. At some point, of course, when you look at a larger and larger system, at some point you get to a point where you have to start to talk about boundary conditions that are not changing. So I'm just going to talk about that. <coughs> what kind of system could it be that has fixed boundary conditions? Uh, so just as a prelude to that, I don't know if you have thought about this, but uh, life it prefers interfaces, that's where you find life. And the reason for that is probably that we think that we can get the best of two worlds, that we can get something from uh, one side of the interface that we are interested in, and from the other side of the inter uh, interface. And this is very typical, for example, most of the biomass in the ocean is concentrated to the surface. And that's because you have light coming from the top, nutrients coming from the bottom, and where you have a reasonable amount of both, that's where you can have life. So you get phytoplankton outside that cell like 10, 20 meters. That's where you get the peak. And sometimes life even uh, produces these interfaces. Huh? So a coral reef, for example, will grow upwards until it hits the interface, and that's where it likes to sit. And for example, uh, in sediments, as you always see that the microbes that sit at some kind of geochemical interface. For example, when you have aerobic oxidation of methane, so methane is coming from below, and oxygen is coming from above, and the interface between these two, that's where you see life, of course. Uh, so there are many examples of that. For example, humans, we prefer to be at the interface between oceans and land, that's where you find most of the cities. Uh, to get the best of both worlds. You get the nice cooling ocean and the transport possibilities of the ocean. At the same time, you get the agriculture and the things we need from land. So that's the best place to sit there. Yeah? And the kind of model of all these interfaces is, of course, the surface of the Earth. Uh, so the interface between the solid Earth and the space outside, from where we get the energy, right? the sun. So, uh, this locus here is kind of a box where you can start to talk about boundary conditions coming from the inside and outside, and talk about how this box as a whole reacts to these boundary conditions. Um, and by the way, this just on this slide I added yesterday because I started to think about how thick is really this green line, how thick is the biosphere. And the standard uh, number is roughly 20 kilometers. And that's based on uh, these guys here, Walsh and Picard. 
we went down to the Marianas Trench in 1960, and they looked out of the window just for a few seconds before they saw the window started to crack, and they had to go up. <laughs> and they saw what fish there, right? Because this place is fish at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. So that's the bottom of the biosphere, people say. And then you have this uh, <coughs> kind of uh, cool birds, right? the bar headed geese. They look cool, and they are cool. They are. Uh, <laughs> they have a world record for flying high, right? because they fly over the Himalayas, and, uh, and they fly up to uh, roughly thirty thousand feet. So then you get this twenty kilometers on biosphere. I think this is a meaningless uh, way to measure the thickness of the biosphere because it's. <laughs> These are these extremes. You should rather look at one point on Earth and see what is the thickness of the biosphere there. If we go outside and look up at any one moment in time, do we see anything above us alive? No, it's nothing. Well, if I stand there for maybe a week, if I'm very lucky, there will be a seagull passing just above my head. Right? But on average, there is nothing up there. Because there's billions of moles. Yeah, but uh, okay. <laughs> the biomass of that is, that is really uh, very small compared to the biomass on the surface of the Earth, right? The, the, the norm outside here of the forest. And then below Earth, there is obviously some kind of what they call deep biosphere. There are microbes down there far below. We don't know how far down, but again, the biomass is very, very small. So I think we should rather define the thickness as, uh, of the biosphere as, for example, uh, where 95% of the biomass is found, for example. <coughs> so you may have 1% of spores up there and 1% of uh, exotic microbes a kilometer down. But on average, let's say 95% of the biomass is. You can go outside and tell me what do you think. I think it's. Here they are, they are mowing the lawn, so it's probably not more than that. Or here is maybe this thing here. 95% of the biomass. There's a tree here and there, but uh, they are quite far apart. So they will not increase the thickness of this bias very much. Right? It would be interesting to find out that an isopact map of the thickness of the biosphere on the Earth. Maybe something that has come up that. That was a side note. But uh, so just an example of how you can try to look at this box as a whole and have bound, simple boundary conditions on it and try to ask interesting questions based on that. Uh, so this is just an example. So let's say that we have this geohydroatmer and I have very weak biosphere. Uh, all these different spheres. Uh, yeah, well, some of the geospheres we have seen. Most things are happening on the surface, like the turbulence. Uh, and then you have an internal energy source, what the Greeks called the central fire. And you have an external energy source. So it's very simple, really, isn't it? It's heat coming in, heat coming out. It's Low, can you get why, this? why do you have low entropy at high temperatures? This is just outcome to the entropy thing. Uh, the sun uh, gives us kind of low entropy energy because of the high temperature. And then we radiate out again energy at a much lower temperature. And that implies an entropy production. Uh, so the surface temperature of the Earth. So this is the not the temperature at the surface of the earth, but the temperature up there somewhere. Uh, so that's a low temperature <coughs> radiation out from the earth. I'll forget about this energy source from inside because that's minuscule compared to what the sun is giving us. Right? So basically, the situation is that we get high temperature radiation coming in. Uh, some of it is reflected because of uh, the albedo. 
And some of it is radiated out again at that lower temperature. Right? So we, the Earth is producing entropy. A black body is the ultimate producer of entropy, right? So then you have this concept of uh, maximum entropy production. How many have heard of maximum entropy uh, production? We have really heard of minimum entropy production. Yeah. The classical idea was the minimum entropy production by printing energy now. And that's the, uh, this is kind of a new age uh, idea in <laughs> physics. Basically, the idea is that you have a second law of hydrodynamics, right? Everything, something happening, then you increase the energy. But the question is, what is the kinetics of that? How fast are you producing energy? And then this, there is this kind of <coughs> quite fashionable idea that when a system has lots of degrees of freedom, then the system regulates itself to have the maximum uh, entropy production rate. And this is observed in many, many systems, and the classical examples are in uh, uh, the atmosphere of the Earth, atmosphere dynamics, where you see that the atmosphere seems to have evolved to a state where the uh, turbulence uh, produces maximum entropy, maximum rate of entropy. And people cannot really give a physical explanation for why this would be, except in maybe some simple cases. And secondly, it's a kind of a hypothesis which you can't disprove, it's not testable in a way, because each time uh, you find an example where you do not have maximum entropy production, then the answer is either that uh, yes, you have maximum entropy production under the constraints, <laughs> right? Okay then. So you, but you can always give that answer, right? No matter. You can always postulate some constraints that uh, will not allow uh, a higher energy <coughs> production. Um, yeah. Okay, anyway. But let's just take this for a fact. It's a fun thing. So then. If you look at uh, the entropy production of the Earth, it's basically like this. This is the uh, energy flux uh, reflected from the Earth, or not reflected, uh, radiated from the Earth, divided by the uh, temperature at the top of the troposphere, and then minus the uh, energy flux coming in divided by the temperature of the incoming radiation as the entropy production. So if you plug things into this, you get uh, the uh, heat flux of the sun multiplied by 1 minus the albedo. So that's basically the incoming flux of energy times 1 over the uh, temperature of the Earth minus 1 over the temperature of the radiation from the Sun. And then you get to kind of this number, which is the entropy production of the Earth as a whole per square meter, because we are using fluxes here per square meter. So 0 0.9 watts per square meter per Kelvin, that's the entropy production of the Earth per square meter. So then you may ask yourself, if you think that this MVP principle holds, how can you increase the entropy production? And that's easy to see from this. You can make the sun stronger, right? And you increase entropy production, but we can't do that. That's not, that's, so that's a constraint. That's not something that the Earth can do. <laughs> or you can make it hotter in this term here, then you also increase the entropy production. But we can't do that either from here. <coughs> or you can decrease the radiative temperature Te, then you also increase the entropy production. And that's exactly what life has done, isn't it? It has decreased the temperature of the Earth by some three and Kelvin because of the loss of the greenhouse effect. In a way, life has, through this term, life has increased the entropy production of the Earth. Another thing you can do is to decrease the albedo, then you will also increase the entropy production. And that's another interesting 
effect of life. Uh, if you look at this picture here, it's a satellite image from the Moldy satellite. It's kind of an average daytime picture. And the fun thing about this picture is that this has been artificially color coded because this was actually a black and white or grayscale image from the satellite, uh, giving you the albedo value. Right? And this has just been color coded now so that the uh, lower albedo values they are greener, and the higher albedo values are more like uh, desert color. <coughs> and the fun thing now is that you don't. This looks exactly like a vegetation map, right? Looks like a real picture of the Earth, showing that where you have vegetation, that's where you have the uh, low albedo. So vegetation reduces the albedo. That's no surprise, of course, because uh, vegetation is doing photosynthesis, and that takes up uh, Energy from the sun, so that's where you expect the low albedo. So, life has reduced the surface temperature of the Earth, increasing the entropy production rate. And life has also decreased the albedo of the Earth significantly, increasing the entropy production rate even further. So, I'm just giving this as an example of how you can try to look at the uh, surface of the Earth as some kind of integrated system, and you can look at the boundary conditions for that, and that's the only kind of way I can defend having boundary conditions in a talk on biology. Just a uh, final slide, really. Uh, and another side note, talking about entropy production and life. This is a famous graph, uh, Aoki, 1994. He put people into a calorimeter, to measure uh, energy input and output. Uh, so he managed to calculate the entropy production for a human being from zero years of age, up to, actually this went further, up to 70 years of age. And what he found was that the entropy production for one individual, this is per individual, not per body mass, mass increases. Now this is, by the way, males and females. So, males produce more mess than females. <laughs> uh, and it peaks at an age of around uh, 18 years or something. And then the rest of this curve goes downwards up to an age of 70. So, the entropy production is going down from the age of about 20. And uh, if you correct for body mass, I don't have that graph here, but then you will see that the peak in entropy production per kilogram peaks at an age of about two years, and then it goes down from there. So then the question is, why do we produce much more energy, now much more entropy, from zero to two years than we do that in the other latest stage in life? And one obvious explanation is simply that you are running around more, so you are doing more, more work, that produces entropy. But another uh, intriguing uh, possible contributor to that is that you are producing order in the body, right? you are organizing the body. So that requires an entropy export, right? You have to export the entropy to reduce the entropy, the structural entropy in the body. There's no more worries about mass than these women in the West. <laughs> <laughs> so just to conclude, uh, <coughs> the abiotic environment is not a simple positive boundary condition for life. Uh, this earth space interface, which is this box, is strongly interconnected uh, to the uh, it's a strongly interconnected biotic abiotic system, and the only boundary conditions you have are really the ones coming from astronomy and from the deep Earth. Um, so this Earth space interface, which is all these spheres, they can be regarded as a box, and then you can start to ask more or less interesting questions about mass, budget, energy, budget, entropy, budget of this system as a whole. And of course, again, to see what contributions life making to this, as we did in the example I gave. And because <coughs> life is 
so important to Earth in every respect. There's really one science that is uh, extremely important, and that is paleontology. The reason for that is that paleontology is the only science that really shows the history of the life as a component in the Earth system. So, uh, I mean, uh, you can't get this information for, from, for example, molecular biology. They can reproduce the phylogenies. They can say uh, we split from the uh, monkeys 10 million years ago or whatever. But they cannot say anything about the contribution that life is making to the Earth system. Uh, and the fun thing about paleontology is that you can combine this information about the evolution of the biosphere with all the geological information and really say something about the links between evolutionary events and changes in the Earth system as well.